We are two weeks into the NFL season, and some teams are off to hot starts, while others are off to very poor starts to say the least. A Super Bowl champion is not crowned after two weeks, of course, but with there only being 17 games, every game in the NFL means that much more. Especially when there's already two games separating teams from being the number one seed and being entirely out of the playoffs. And that's why starting the year on the right note is such a big deal. And it's time we have a conversation about four teams in particular. Not all four teams in today's video are 0-2, but they all envisioned a better start to the year than what it's been through the first two weeks. The expectations of the teams in today's video were vastly different, as not all four teams were expected to compete for a Super Bowl this year, but it's been a tough start for these four teams in particular. I don't expect an overnight fix for a couple of these teams, but I do want to see more than what we've seen through the first two games because it's been very concerning. And with that preface out of the way, let's dive right in! And we are starting today's video by discussing the Baltimore Ravens. The Ravens are 0-2 with losses to the Raiders and Chiefs, and full transparency, I am completely fine with the loss in KC, and when you lose to a team that's won the Super Bowl three times in the past five years in their stadium, there's no shame in that, especially when you were a foot away from going for two to go for the win. Yes, it's a tough loss, but it's not the end of the world. But after having a couple of extra days to prepare for the Raiders and to really digest the 0-1 start, I didn't think the Raiders had a chance in Week 2. I didn't think the Raiders would be able to go into Baltimore and beat this team, knowing what an 0-2 start represents. But they did, and we're at a point with John Harbaugh where I am not calling for him to be fired as they are coming off of a 13-win season, and there's a reason this franchise has been so successful over the past 15 years, but there are a couple of things that are concerning for the Ravens. And the biggest concern, to me, without a doubt, is how this team has lost games over the past few years. From 2008 to 2021, the Ravens were 79-0 when leading by double digits in the fourth quarter, but since then the Ravens have the most losses in the NFL when leading by double digits in the fourth. They have nine losses in the past few years in which they've blown a double digit lead. And this of course excludes normal losses in which it's a close game all throughout. And that's a big problem because I don't know what the solution is moving forward. I really think John Harbaugh is a great coach and a great CEO type leader of this organization, and there's been very few teams to have the type of consistent success the Ravens have had since Harbaugh took over. And what's particularly frustrating about the double digit loss to the Raiders is the Ravens had them where they wanted them, and they let them off the hook. Baltimore wants to have teams down in the fourth quarter so they can run at you with the two-headed monster in Lamar Jackson and Derrick Henry. After Las Vegas made it a 23-16 game, the Ravens went 3-0, and out, and when it was 3rd and 5, the Raiders had a neutral zone infraction to make it 3rd and inches, and then Derrick Henry had a false start to put it back to 3rd and 5. Lamar threw an incomplete pass, and the Raiders got the ball and scored a touchdown on their ensuing drive. With Four minutes to play, Lamar took a sack and the Ravens basically gave up. They called a draw on 2nd and 19, which gained nothing, and when you have 3rd and 19 in a tie game with 3 minutes to play, you really don't want to force a pass into double coverage, which would subsequently give the game away. So the Ravens again went 3 and out and gave Vegas the opportunity to take the lead and win the game, which they did. And winning in the AFC and having the number one seed is obviously crucial because you don't have to play three road games just to get to the Super Bowl. But Baltimore's next three games are at Dallas, home against Buffalo, and at Cincinnati. I do not think they will be 0-5, but the outlook for this team is concerning. I would argue the Raiders game in Week 2 was a must-win game, and the Ravens let the one they should win slip away. The Colts, on the other hand, have looked disappointing through the first two weeks relative to the expectations they had just two weeks ago. I know a lot of people have opinions on Anthony Richardson, and he has not been perfect, which was to be expected from a project quarterback. I thought the two interceptions he threw against Green Bay were bad, and I don't think there is an excuse for those plays. And he technically threw three interceptions, but I am willing to excuse a Hail Mary interception at the end of the game. But this is a lot more than an Anthony Richardson problem. Sure, you can make the argument that completing just 26 of 53 passes in the first two games while throwing three touchdowns to four interceptions is a hindrance to the team, and you would be right. But AR is such an anomaly and the plays he has the capability of making that you are okay with those results knowing touchdowns like the ones to Alec Pierce in the season opener can happen on any single play. 
but there's been drop passes, which obviously makes Anthony's completion percentage look a lot worse than it should be. And the bigger problem with the Colts is they have been absolutely embarrassed in the run game, on defense that is. I included this in the week 2 recap with full intention of diving into this in a video later this week, but the Texans and Packers in the two games they've played Indy have combined for 474 rushing yards on 93 rushing attempts. And whether your quarterback is Anthony Richardson, Josh Allen, Patrick Mahomes, whoever, you're not going to win games like that, period. This is a major problem because the Colts' rushing defense in 2023 finished 10th in yards per carry allowed as they allowed just 4.1 yards per attempt. But through two games in 2024, they're allowing an average of 5.1 yards per carry, which is a full yard difference. And obviously that adds up over the course of a game and ultimately a season. I am willing to dismiss the Week 1 Texans loss because everyone expected the Texans to take a step and they're 2-0 and already have a two-game division lead. So I would be surprised if they don't win the division, but Week 2 against the Packers is an entirely different thing. Malik Willis was the team's starting quarterback, and this was the first start of Malik's career where he threw for more than 100 yards. Obviously, Malik didn't turn the football over in this game, and that was going to be critical for the Packers to have a chance at winning with a backup quarterback, but knowing what their game plan was heading into the week and still not being able to stop it is something else. Sure, Anthony Richardson has struggled at times throughout the first two games of the year, but when you've lost the time of possession battle, and this is not an exaggeration, 40 to 20 in both games, not one, but both, you are going to be in for a long year. And the way the Colts have lost both games so far is honestly how I expected them to win games. It's been frustrating on both sides of the ball. The Colts also aren't using motion pre-snap as much as you would like to help out their young 22-year-old quarterback either. The results aren't great for Indy right now, but they're also not helping themselves offensively in situations they should. The Colts defense is a major problem, and they have been absolutely dominated in the trenches through the first two games. Denver is another team I have concerns about, and it's more so due to the situation around their young quarterback. Bo Nix has not played well in the first few games of his career, but I think there needs to be context. I don't like when people dunk on young players for the sake of dunking and thinking they're going to fail 120 minutes into their NFL career. Now, there's been very bad plays by Bo, and the interception to Corey Trice during the Steelers game was bad, and Bo didn't see him, and the play speaks for itself. But I think it's a combination of a lot of bad things all into one. Bo is not playing well, and I don't think he's confident either, and it shows. If you've watched the Broncos throughout the first few weeks, Bo is doing a lot of what he did during his time at Oregon, which is either throw the ball behind the line of scrimmage or within a few yards of the line of scrimmage. Bo's raw stats through two games is bad, as he's completed just 46 of 77 passes for 384 yards, no touchdowns, and four interceptions. The final interception in the Steelers game was not a typical Hail Mary, and it was not a good play, obviously, but I don't think that one play should persuade your opinion of a player trying to make a play in a 13-6 game on the final play of the game. I think the other 76 passes he's thrown, and more importantly, some of the reads he has not made should. What I also think is frustrating for Bo is his offensive line has not played well, and what's even more frustrating about that is Denver has poured a lot of assets into the offensive line. They really have. Whether it's paying left tackle Garrett Bowles, or right tackle Mike McGlinchey, or even this offseason paying Quinn Miners, Denver's offensive line should not be as bad as it is. I think we live in an era where people want to see results immediately, and if they don't, they're very quick to write a guy off. And while Bo hasn't been good, he has been the leading rusher in each of the first two games of the year. Bo Nix was the sixth quarterback taken in the 2024 draft, and unfortunately through two games, he's played like it. Of his 77 passes, he is just 11 of 36 for 212 yards with four interceptions on passes thrown more than five yards down the field. His 30.6% completion percentage on those passes is the lowest in the league by 6% and the worst figure in weeks 1 and 2 in the last 10 years, and this is per Austin Gale of The Ringer. Now, Bo's debut was against one of the best defensive minds in the league in Mike McDonald, and I would not want a rookie quarterback making his NFL debut against that defense of all defenses. But within that game, in a game where Bo threw two interceptions, he could have easily thrown two or three more. 
and to complete just 30% of your passes five or more yards down the field, to me, is nothing short of concerning. I mean, guys, this is the NFL. This is not high school football. Yes, you can say the run game hasn't been good, and you can say the offensive line has let him down at times, but there's plays and reads Bo has made through his first two games that are incredibly concerning. I'm not saying he's already doomed, but even when he's had time to sit back and make a play, a lot of the time he hasn't. And the drops hurt in week two, don't get me wrong, but there's also a handful of plays that a 24-year-old quarterback should and should not be making. And because of all of this, I think this is a combination of a poor run game, an unconfident quarterback, and a coach who may be way over in his head, all in one situation. Next up is the Chicago Bears, and they're in today's video for a few reasons. It honestly scares me how similar the situations look between Justin Fields and Caleb Williams three years later. The big difference, of course, is Caleb Williams has great receivers to throw the ball to, but Caleb was sacked seven times in week two against the Texans, and there were a couple of plays in particular, as you'll see from the screenshot from right tackle Darnell Wright, in which he was immediately toasted by Daniil Hunter, where... Caleb was set up for failure from the start, and granted, Caleb has not played well throughout the first two games, and there was a couple of plays in particular that I know Caleb wishes he had back, but this situation has the potential to be downright scary, and Caleb didn't play well in week one either against the Titans. Now, winning will exclude you from a lot of criticism whenever you ultimately take care of business and whenever you start the year 1-0, especially with a number one overall pick, but... Let's go ahead and have that discussion about the Titans game. Chicago won with a score of 24 to 17. And there was a stat recently on an ESPN podcast where teams that had a three score lead that did not allow an offensive touchdown in previous games were 336 and two prior to the Titans Bears game. As we know, the Bears did not have an offensive touchdown against the Titans and Will Levis basically gifted them a pick six and it forced teams that were 336 and two to now 336 and three that did not allow an offensive touchdown yet had a three score lead and still found a way to lose. So there are a lot of concerns with the Bears and it starts with the offensive line. Can Darnell Wright develop into a great player? I think he can, and I don't think he is the lone problem here. I think there's a lot of problems along the Bears' offensive line. But one thing that was always a concern for me entering the year was Justin Fields and Caleb Williams from a time-to-throw aspect. They're very similar players. They both take forever to get rid of the ball, and obviously they're each going to have magical plays where they extend the play and Caleb finds a guy 65 yards downfield and, and your jaw drops, but he needs his time to throw like any player, and there's a big difference between a guy like Joe Burrow and a guy like Tua who gets the ball out fast. Obviously, Caleb's going to have the, the bigger highlight plays because Caleb can get out and move, and he's going to you know find the guy 40 yards downfield where Tua, when healthy, is not that guy. No disrespect, he's just not going to be that guy. And that was always a concern for me entering the 2024 season, and it's reared its ugly head in not just one game, but two games now. And again, winning takes care of everything, so the Bears were kind of excluded from criticism last week, and sure, people brought it up, but it wasn't as big of a deal as it is now, especially after a loss in which the Bears put up just 13 points on the road, and their rookie quarterback was sacked again seven times. Now, one other concern that I have with the Bears moving forward is... Matt Eberflus is 11 and 25 lifetime as a head coach. I thought it was a concern heading into the year that they did not hire an offensive mind to be Caleb's head coach for hopefully the next five, six years, maybe even the duration of Caleb's career, although that is a bit far-fetched, but at least an offensive-minded coach to be Caleb's guy right from the start. And my biggest fear was that a coach that prior to the start of the season, that was 10 and 24 lifetime, was going to be fired after Caleb's rookie season and that we would effectively be starting over in 2025. And as of now, there's a decent possibility that's the case because if the Bears don't make the playoffs this year, which I would be surprised if they did, are they going to keep Matt Eberflus after three straight non-playoff seasons? That's a question that, that nobody knows the answer to right now, that I would be eager to see how that situation plays out. Now, to at least be fair to Eberflus, the 2022 Bears at the end of the season were awful, especially after they traded Roquan and Robert Quinn and everybody else, and there was not going to be a head coach that was going to lead that team to the playoffs, so at least be somewhat fair to Matt Eberflus there, but 
I don't think Matt Eberflus is a great head coach. I don't think he's a top seven or eight head coach in the league. And when you need coaching now more than ever, and I think the Chargers are a great example of what good coaching can do for an organization, what are the Bears going to do after this year? I would kind of be surprised if Matt Eberflus is the guy in 2025, and that's without knowing how the season's going to play out. I don't think Caleb Williams is going to be a bust just 120 minutes into his NFL career, and I don't want that to be the takeaway, but I do think it is very concerning in terms of how they are setting him up to fail the way they just did with Justin Fields from an offensive line perspective. I really hope the Bears get it right and that they fix the offensive line, but in the middle of the season, how much are you really going to be able to get things right and to be able to set things straight? And that's one of the biggest concerns that I have with the Bears moving forward. I hope you enjoyed today's video, and if you did, please like and subscribe, as only about 31% of people watching are subscribed, and helps the channel tremendously. Until next time, please be safe and have a great day. Love you guys.